I hate doing slides. I always say I'm never going to do slides, and I don't do slides. And then I stay up all night kind of putting some slides together. Because I, I start with the idea, well, just one slide. I'm just going to put a picture of the Earth up there. Because, you know, the overview effect, you guys have heard of that. And so I, I, I figure you'll just have this positive feeling about me just because the Earth is over there. <laughs> So I always, I always start with one slide, but you know how it goes. Um, and the other reason I put it up there is, is to remind us that it is the only living biosphere in the known universe. Like, the whole damn thing, as far as we can tell right now. I'm optimistic, but it's just there, just hanging out in space. We can't find another one like it. No matter how far we look, we can't find a planet with a cockroach on it at this point. And I'm sorry to, to say, but it's, it's also dying. It just happens to be dying as well. Um, and the reason is like us, right? And, you know, sorry to start your Sunday morning off this way. Um, since you're not in church getting hellfire and brimstone, maybe, you know, I can give it to you here. Uh, and one pattern I've picked up on is that we've got two major forces in society right now. We have business and technology. Business and technology get along together, like, super well. So business says to technology, um, I will perfect you and proliferate you. And we, we can see these towers of... Uh, office space where people are going in every day to make technology better and technology turns back to us and says and I will make you powerful and rich and that conversation has been going on for a long time and it works out really well it's an incredible symbiosis the only problem is that the planet has been left out of the symbiosis and so this is going to hurt a little but the the majority of the human race right now is engaged primarily with turning the only living biosphere in the known universe, into gadgets, garbage, and cash as quickly as it can. And I get to say this kind of stuff because I'm not, a, I'm not some, you know, Luddite, not some, <laughs> I'm not going to say no other words because I'll disenfranchise some group out there. The Luddites, I, I, don't, I don't think they're around anymore. But um, I have a background in computer science, right? I'm a tech entrepreneur. Frankly, I'm a wealthy individual, and I am telling you that that is what's going on. There's also no... Um, Lines, like on a map, you'll notice. You know those maps, all those states we've memorized, countries we've memorized? They're, you can't find them anywhere on there. Maybe the Great Wall of China. And yet those lines have become so real to us, so frightening to us, should they be moved or overrun, that we have whole swaths of our species devoted to creating war machines and weapons with no point other than to strategically and systematically end human life. This is what's going on, right? And so I've been saying to people, hey, what is a country for? How, how big should a country be? How many countries should there be? When should a country change its shape? Nobody knows. Nobody knows, and it's like scary to ask. Like, I think you're like, end up on a watch list just for like, saying this or something. And and so if that weren't crazy enough, these lines have become so real that we've created nuclear weapons that can now take an entire city off the face of the earth. If that happens, I know that I am going to ask myself, dude, what have you been doing all this time? Like, you knew, you knew it was a problem. You knew we had weapons. You knew we had, you know, egos and pain bodies and out-of-control minds. And it's just like, this, you kind of knew this would happen. And I'm asking myself that question now. Don't worry, we have a backup plan, and that is Mars. Very popular plan here in Silicon Valley, but I like to remind people that it only makes so much sense to leave a dying planet for an already completely dead planet. <laughs> and of course, the plan is not to leave the planet for Mars. I hope it is to spread to Mars. And if you look at Mars, we're going to have to get into the business of turning completely dead planets into living ones. And we have a perfect opportunity here to turn a dying planet back into a living one. It's really the perfect setup. I spent time as a, as a tech entrepreneur and managed to, to make money while making the world a better place um, with a, a public transit technology company I started a dozen years ago. And then 
after that, I got into urban agriculture and, and the food system and blah, blah, blah. And, and I got some nice awards like from the White House. And they said, you're doing a good job. You're doing good stuff out there. And I said, thanks. And gave it to my parents. They get a kick out of that stuff. And it didn't take long for me to realize, though, that it, it kind of didn't matter. Like for all the awards that we're handing out to each other, we're really behind the curve. And I figured this out because I had free time. I had free time now to ask any question I wanted on a daily basis and get any answers that came. And, I, and, and as educated I was as I was becoming, it was like every week I was discovering a whole human institution that was failing and a whole industry that was fucked. And so, you know, I made for an interesting, um, if not overbearing dinner guest, but <laughs> came to the conclusion that the human race, the consciousness of the human race, is insufficient. Our current level of consciousness is currently insufficient to support 7.5 billion people on this globe. So then I had, um, I let that sit for a while in my mind, and then I had this vision. I had a vision of, um, oh, sorry, I have, a, I have a very authoritative graph here. Um, here's consciousness of human society. Here's, at the bottom, there's no awareness that we're destroying the planet, like we used to be there. Um, and we're like considering not destroying the planet, like we're sort of there. We're kind of in between those two right now. There's a lot of that going on. Then there's trying to stop destroying the planet. And a lot of us have, you know, lifted a couple fingers to do that. We put stuff in the recycling bin. And then there's working to regenerate the planet. And not many people are actually doing something during the day that regenerates the planet. And even though I know a few, it's still are questionable whether they're even regenerating the planet more than the planet gives up for them to be alive on a daily basis. Like when you really realize where we have to go to regenerate a planet. So I had this vision. I had this vision and I, and I, I saw that the life force was like stymied, that things wanted to evolve, things wanted to change, and we were gumming it up. Like we had these countries and, and governments and and our level of consciousness, and we didn't want to change, and we liked, you know, the size of our backyard or whatever, and the life force just couldn't move. And I had this vision, after I learned about Bitcoin, I got it one day. The life force had transcended. It had, it had sort of had this pressure building up with us blocking it and all of our institutions, and it had transcended. It had, like, gone meta and shot through the roof and gone to live on the internet. And so I, I struggled to find a technical diagram that could describe this, but I found one. So here you have um, technology, finance, and governance um, transcending into the cloud, <laughs> bestowing upon us distributed ledgers, which we can access with public and private keys. I found the diagram. So this gave me a lot of hope, because I saw that the, this was the most important thing to happen in um, money and governance for thousands of years, like truly. And I saw that the life force would, was finding a way to flow, and that it would it, take us with it. It would help our consciousness again to move, whether we liked it or not, whether we were aware of it or not. And, and so I did a, a few little things, and I, um, you know, helped, uh, helped Vitalik... Uh, get a scholarship a few months before he became a billionaire, I think. But, you know, I was, thought I was doing the right thing, and I think I did. Um, and I also invested a little bit, and that's, that was a funny story, because I, I forgot about it. Like, I just invested, and then I just went off to, like, um, grow vegetables or something. And then one day I was hanging out with a buddy, and he's just, like, he's dressed like he just came from Burning Man, and he's, like, telling me about all his art projects, and he's got a new warehouse, and I'm just like, dude, what are you doing? And he's like, art. I'm like, no, for money, what are you doing? He's like... Dude, I bought Ethereum. I was like, did that turn into something? And he said, yeah. I said, I own some too. He said, you better go check on it, man. So I was pretty happy when I checked on it. Um, true story. And what's, what's embarrassing, though, is what it kind of did to me. I, like, got the bug. Like, now that I had more money than I ever imagined for the second time, I thought, what if I could have even more money than I ever imagined? And I got, like, the whole ICO craze, right? And then... There we are at the house getting up at like 5 a.m. to like beam money to some kids somewhere. We don't even know what they're doing. Nobody's bothered to read the white paper. It's too boring. And, 
And we're doing this over and over again. And, and over time, sometimes it felt good because I felt like, yeah, we're helping the life force evolve us. And then other times I was just like, I don't feel good. Like, what am I doing actually? And I realized that a lot of these ICOs, uh, they only made sense if you got in at the right time and got out at the right time, which was like two days after it hit the open market or something. And I realized that was like a zero sum game and it only worked if I bought at the right time and then if I sold at the right time and if some schmuck bought at the wrong time. And, and I realized that to play that game and be good at it, I had, to, I had to like close my heart. I had to pretend this other person didn't exist. And I realized so that now this was hurting my consciousness and that the old level of consciousness had snuck into the, the new substrate and I'd lost sight of the beauty. And I realized I didn't want to make money that way, so I stopped. You, you can, you can make money that way. And, and maybe for some of you that's right, but I decided I had enough and I, I backed away from the, the ICO machines. But I'm not here to be a downer, I'm here to remind us that we are the creators. Um, we determine how good this gets. We determine how beautiful this gets. And how, how do we do that? And I believe it's literally by holding beautiful visions in our minds and in our hearts. And if we were to make a graph or a pie chart or something of just what's running through your system on a daily basis and we saw how much of that time was spent holding a beautiful vision, I think that's actually how this works. And so here today, just for a few more minutes, I would like to hold some beautiful visions together. So where is the token um, that decreases in value as we um, lose species, as species go extinct. Where is the token that increases in value as biodiversity increases? Where is the token that um, increases in value as the air quality improves? Where is the token, where is the coin I can get into that rises in value when um, mercury and plastic are yanked out of the ocean? Like, tell me about those ones. And another beautiful vision is that I do think the blockchain right now is the greatest hope for um, the evolution of the nation state and peace. Because <laughs> at some point, we've got to find a way to allow countries to breathe and move and for squiggly invisible lines that don't exist to be changed without a lot of people dying. And the blockchain actually right now holds the greatest promise for that. Even further, it might end the nation state. It might lead to a, a situation, a de hitching of, of governance from geopolitical borders such that we can subscribe like templates to different laws of governance that suit our personalities and roam the world more freely. The point to get across here is that programmable money means that we can begin to program money with our values, with ethics, leaving mercenary money behind. Right now we have mercenary money. It's good for, it's good for ill as much as it is for good. You can do anything with it. And what I'm really excited about is tying program, program programmable money to our evolution. What happens when we tie wealth to the amount of um, trauma that's resolved in our lives, the amount of fear that's released, the amount of shame that's dissolved in the human species? Because what I've discovered in my explorations of consciousness is that as that happens, our consciousness lightens automatically. Heal and your consciousness lightens automatically. That's my definition of enlightenment. I believe that cryptocurrencies offer us the possibility of funding our evolution. There are thousands of modalities out there that you can avail yourself of that I have availed myself of, hundreds already over the past few years, that um, do wonderful things to reorganize and reprogram you and allow us to elevate our own consciousness. And what's amazing is we can now emphasize those, regardless of whether we can get a venture capitalist to, to care or not. We can create and bootstrap funding initiatives for things that matter. So for instance, what if there was a heal coin or a therapy token? And, and all that really takes, listen closely here, is for enough therapists to decide that they will accept it. They can get like their nephew to make it, and then they all decide to accept it. And then they give it out, and they render their services. And ex nihilo, from nothing, by decree, they have now conferred value upon this token that is doing something very good in society. 
you could float that on an open market and people would invest in it and you could have billions of dollars flow into something that would currently be uninvestable with no business model. These are the opportunities that are waiting for us. But some people just want to make some money, right? It's like, and I got to admit, money's great. Like, get you some, okay? Money's great. If that's, you want to, you know, make crypto millions, like, do it. But I actually don't think money's going to be around for much longer. I think money's going away. I think in 30 years, um, there won't be such a thing. And it's going to look really silly if you're still sitting on a giant pile of it then when it becomes worthless. I think the point of, <laughs> the point of money now is its voltage to be applied. It's voltage to take away from systems that are no longer serving us and ones that need to be spun up so that we can continue to evolve on this blue dot. So I, <laughs> I do believe we can create heaven on earth. I'm out of time. I believe that if we align our incentives and our wealth um, with the evolution of the human species. And we will look back in 50 years and look on ourselves today and in our busy-minded, traffic-jammed lives the way we look back on cavemen from this vantage point. That's actually what I'm working toward in my lifetime. And it all depends on what technology like the blockchain uh, does with us and what we do with it. So without further ado, welcome to the conference. Let it begin.